here. All right. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this monthly occasion of the UAC webinar series. Um, today we have Ana Rita Brochado from the University of Würzburg in Germany with us. She has recently started her own group, so she's a group leader at the university, and she's bringing to us uh, her project working on deciphering antimicrobial combinations using high throughput approaches approaches, which I'm really excited to, to hear and listen to. Um, I will ask you guys to, if you have questions throughout, uh, Anna has told me that it's okay to just pose your questions when they come. So I ask you to please raise your hand. I'm going to be taking care of looking at the list. And if anybody has any questions, then I will uh, kind of stop the presentation and ask uh, for you to either say your question out loud, or you can also write your question in the chat. The seminar is being recorded. So have that in mind in case you don't want to have your voice in, in a recording that is going to be later post online. You can always write your questions in the chat and I will be for sure uh, sending this to Anna. And apart from that, uh, another thing, Anna is also going to be interviewed for our podcast. So if you want to learn a bit more about her path, how she ended up where she is now, what she's studying a little bit more, um, that is going to be released on the June episode of the podcast. And also, in case you guys haven't heard, we have a new round of funding. And now there are quite so many PhD positions open to join uh, the center as well. So if you are interested or you know anybody that is interested, you can always check out our website and that's my my ads for today i will stop sharing my screen and i give the floor to anna thank you so much for being with us we look forward to your presentation thank you well, thanks a lot uh eva so let me just start sharing my screen By now, you should be able to see my screen. Please tell yes, me. Yes, correct. That's Perfect. So thanks a lot for the introduction. And without, without, without much delay, I will uh, start. So I'm very glad to be here. Um, today, as uh, Eva already mentioned, uh, I uh, have a junior group. So we do uh, we, we research in systems biology of antibiotic action in the University of, at the University of Pittsburgh. This is pretty much in the middle of Germany, or it's considered southern Germany. Weather is quite nice. It is it's, it's pretty it's pretty beautiful. And uh, my my lab. So as I say, I started my lab um, in 2019. My students are now one and a half year. Uh, through and, and the questions that we want to answer is what mechanisms explain or drive drug combinations. So we work on antibiotics as, with a special focus in drug combination and with this perspective we want to know how and if and why they change across species uh, or across environments. And uh, we do this sometimes, for example, in different media, but also very often in, in more in infection relevant setting. But in the end of the day, and this is quite interesting, we, won't, we mostly work with established drugs or established antibiotics, but we always end up asking what actually are these drugs doing? Yeah, they are old to some extent, they are known, um, but as you will uh, realize throughout the talk, we know a little bit about the drugs that we are already using in the clinics for quite a long time. Uh, and I, I start by acknowledging because I came, I became interested in this topic during my postdoc. I did a postdoc with the with NASA Stipas, uh, the MBL in Heidelberg, um, and he works in chemical genomics uh, of, of antibiotics. And then when I joined this lab, we said, okay, let's try to see what what combinations are doing. And why were we, why were why are we interested in combinations? Because Combinations have, uh, when you combine two drugs, uh, there are one possible outcome uh, that is usually very, very interesting for, for clinical applications that you might get a stronger effect than when you have the drugs alone, when you have them combined. Um, and this is, of course, very interesting to the clinics because you can use these drugs at lower concentrations and get the same and get a, a better effect. However, drugs should not com be combined at random because uh, the opposite can also happen. So you can also get, and you will see throughout the talk that frequently enough, you actually get an antagonism, which is characterized by the weaker effect of the combination as compared to the drugs alone. 
And there are several open questions in the field. They were open when I started and uh, by far they were not all answered, but there are many uh, questions in this field that, uh, that I would like to, to answer throughout my career. One is that we can understand what are the driving principles of, of synergy and antagonism so that we can predict it at the end. Second, <clears throat> What is the conservation? Because I find a synergy that works against the pathogen. Can I say that it works against the next pathogen in line or even against the strain of the same, of the same species, another isolate, for example? And third, what is the mechanism that drives this, these drug combinations? And in order to answer these questions, um, we, set up, uh, uh, to, we set out to acquire the very, very large data set of drug combinations in bacteria we focus in gram negative. Bacteria, and we, we wanted to use it to derive drug principle, uh, principles of drug interactions. And uh, from now on, I also refer, I always referred at synergy and antagonism as drug interactions. The combination um, does not need to have an interaction. Actually, most of the combinations are additive. Uh, but when they have an interaction, being a synergy or an, or an antagonism, we assume that there is an interaction. Yeah. Uh, so we, use, we wanted to use this data set, as I was saying, to derive principles of drug interactions. To, do, to find out molecular mechanism and to further establish their clinical relevance. And for that, our strategy was to set up a large, a large screen. We used six strains of three, um, uh, three gram-negative species. The part, uh, uh, part, these, these species are all part of the, of the priority pathogens by the, by the WHO, although I have to say uh, that the, the ones that we selected for the screen, they're all sensitive. We did not want to include uh, multi-drug resistant pathogens in the screen. Then um, we, we uh, piled up, so to say, a, a group of 80 drugs. Most of them, um, they, they are well-established antibiotics. They target folate biosynthesis. They target DNA gyrase. They target the cell wall. So very, very well-established drugs, uh, antibiotics. But we decided to include about 20%, 20 to 25% of the compounds. They were human targeted drugs, such as aspirin or so, because either we found relevance, in, uh, either we, find, we found um, um, hints in the literature that this could be important for drug action. Or um, a friend of mine in the lab at the same time was also discovering that a lot of human targeted drugs can have a quite significant effect in, for example, gut microbes. And, the other thing that makes this screen quite unique is that when we screen drug combinations, it's very difficult. They are, they are heavily concentration dependent, so I couldn't choose the concentration to go for. So we screened every single combination uh, in a concentration defined manner. Uh, and this makes the screen, the experimental part, quite challenging, as you will see. At the end, we piled up, we piled up more than half a million growth curves and we used them to detect more than 2,000 synergies and antagonisms. And I always like to put the things in perspective, especially when there are students in the audience, so that they can have, get a feeling for actually what was, what was done. So basically, very, very strictly, simply speaking, we were measuring bacterial growth with antibiotics alone and in combination, no more than that. Yeah, so basically, if, if we have here representing OD, we are co co collecting OD over time, so optical density over time. Um, for without a drug and with a certain concentration of the drug. Uh, but in order to uh, achieve these numbers, we do this in a plate reader, in a microtype plate format. And even if we have uh, 384 well plates, this would take more than four years to do if we take it and if we do it in one single plate reader. And this is including New Year's, Christmas, my birthday, and every, uh, every day. And this is also not even the most difficult part because data analysis is also to be considered. Of course, uh, we did not take this uh, way. What we did was we we used we heavily used automated robotic platforms um, to help us getting these experiments done. And with that, I moved to the first result and probably the most striking result that we had during the whole during the, this whole uh, study. So first, we found um, that drug interactions, the synergy and antagonism are fairly conserved within species. So 70% of the interactions seem to occur um, uh, in a conserved manner within the species. Whatever we found for one of the E. coli, we also found it for the other one, and the E. coli that they had are actually pretty far distant. Um, I also heard people saying that 70, they even think 70% is low. Uh, well, for me, it's quite high compared 
with what we observe across species. So when we compare the three species, we, we realize that only 5% of all measured interactions are conserved um, for the three species. And this is quite, what I found is quite surprising because as I told you before, we mostly use established antibiotics and most of the, the established antibiotics, they are broad spectrum. So they, they have conserved drug targets. Um, and by the time when we started this study, there was one study that was pointing to the fact that uh, the, 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 the drug interactions would go through the targets. But then we started questioning this because if it would really go through the targets, then uh, we would expect to have some more uh, conservation. And I think this is one of the most, um, most um, impressive or, or astonishing study that we had. We did not dig more into for this publication in this study because this is one of the things that I actually brought to, to, to ground my land. Um, but this study had a lot of data so we could continue learning from it. Uh, and what, what you see here is um, a drug interaction network that we observed that we obtained for E. coli. Uh, the, the, the nodes, so these dots, uh, represent different drug classes and the edges, so these are the lines that, uh, that connect the different dots, represent antagonism if they are orange or synergy if they are, if they are blue. And one thing that I would like to drive your attention to is that first of all, we find antagonism to be highly prevalent. In fact, we find more antagonisms than synergy. So please don't go around eating drugs at random because this is not, it might not be good. Higher chances that the, the effect is the opposite of what we are expecting or hoping for. Then we also found that antagonism occurs almost exclusively across targets. And this is what you can see here. So here we basically count the edges that link antibiotics with the, that link um, uh, the nodes that represent the same target. And what we realized is that antagonism occurs almost ex exclusively uh, um, across different targets. So it is quite promiscuous. And one thing that I'm not showing here, we also, real, we also, sh we also found out that antagonism is much less conserved than synergy. Synergy is fairly conserved, but antagonism is really not conserved. So we started wondering what mechanisms could drive antagonisms. There is a very nice paper from Tobias Bollenbach that shows what, what drives antagonism between DNA and, and, and the protein synthesis inhibitors in E. coli. And we, in this case, so it's a target-based uh, target mechanism. In this case, we started wondering what about drug transport because we are working with gram negatives and gram negatives are known to be very tricky in what drug transport is concerned. So what we started thinking is what if the second drug, adding a second drug um, <clears throat> is actually preventing the uptake of the antibiotic or promoting is it efflux? This would be one uh, possibility why, uh, why um, uh, antagonism is so promiscuous and not conserved because the regulation of transport machinery differs across bacteria. So if you now pay, see here, this is my toy uh, cell envelope for, for a gram-negative bacterium with an outer and an inner membrane with a, with a peptidoglycan layer on the, in, in, in the cytoplasm. And I represent here the machineries that are important for drug uptake and efflux. And basically what we're saying, okay, by definition, a good antibiotic is an, is an, is an antibiotic that the drugs can uptake, the, the bacteria can uptake to a certain level that is over competing the efflux and the antibiotic stays inside and inhibits the target. And what we are thinking is that maybe the second drug is somehow disturbing this balance in a way that we have a decreased antibiotic concentration inside the cells. And so in order to test this hypothesis, we measure the intracellular concentration of two antibiotics in the presence of their antagonizing drugs. And the antibiotics that, that we selected was, uh, uh, we chose two, uh, ciprofloxacin, which is um, DNA, DNA replication inhibitor, and, prot and uh, gentamicin, which is a protein synthesis inhibitor. So they are widely, they are both clinically important the drug classes, they are, but they have very different targets, they have very different transport mechanisms, um, and they have antagonism with broad, broad class of, 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 uh, um, of compounds. And if you see here, so this is the, this is ciprofloxacin, every line here means an antagonism, and every, every uh, node in this network is a drug, and the color reflects its drug class. So you see that they have at least four drug classes that can antagonize ciprofloxacin. Um, and 
And now I'll show you the results that we obtained for ciprofloxacin. Gentamicin is very similar. So basically what you can see here is that we measure into a cellular concentration of ciprofloxacin alone, and this is normalized to itself. So you see one here. And then we added, for example, paraquat. You saw it coming down to almost 50%. And this goes on and on for most, of, for many of the compounds that we did independently of their mode of action. Um, and all of them de significantly decreased the, the concentration of ciprofloxacin inside E. coli, with except for curcumin. And just before you ask, I don't know <laughs> why uh, we did not pick up on this. Um, I know that there is uh, there is quite some curcumin is is is, part, is a food uh, food additive. It's highly used. It's curcuma, so we eat it very often. That's why we put it in. Um, by the time we didn't know much, I think nowadays there's quite some people trying actually to understand the antibiotic uh, effect and the, antibi the, the antimicrobial effects of curcumin. But we basically have no idea um, why would it be um, uh, um, in this case, is antagonizing ciprofloxacin, but it doesn't. It doesn't seem to change the intracellular concentration. Okay, going back to the story now. So this is what we observed for ciprofloxacin, which, as I told you, for gentamicin, the story was really rather the, the view is really really similar. So what we could <clears throat> say at this time is that here you see this we represent number of antagonisms in the y-axis, and this is for the two different drugs. And uh, we then extrapolate it for remaining amino glucosides and fluoroquinolones. And we can, what we can say is that at least 50% of the antagonisms seem to be um, or seem to occur the same time as the antibiotic concentration is uh, decreased uh, inside of the, of the bacteria. And note, please, that the ones that are white here, we, don't, we did not test. So we, don't, we did not test everything. So what we don't test, we cannot say. But for the ones we test, there was a significant um, uh, pro proportion of antagonisms that we have, what we see this occurring. And already by then I thought, okay, this is, we still don't know the molecular mechanism because we still don't know how the second drug is influenced, the, influencing the transport. And in this case, I would like to pinpoint your attention to one of the compounds. So we decided to take on vanillin uh, and ask how is vanillin, uh, 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 how is the, van this, the, the antagonism between superfloxacin and vanillin then working? And for this, we actually made use of the entire data set. So I took the entire that we took the entire data set. We made a heat map with this data set. And what you see here is that we clustered uh, the interactions of each drug across all the bugs. And what you see here, that these are the 75 drugs that we had tested for the, all the three species. What you see here is that drugs with the same colors, and again, colors here represent drug classes. So drugs with the same colors tend to join together uh, on this map, at least to a certain extent. So this, for example, are beta-lactams. They behave uh, very similarly across all drug interactions. Um, these are uh, uh, food additives and uh, human targeted drugs, also very similarly across all, all their interaction profile. Uh, here you see, um, um, sorry, lipopolysaccharide and membrane, and, and membrane uh, disrupting uh, drugs. And here, right in this spot, we have vanillin. And what we, what we, or what we postulate is okay. If the if the if we have similar, we have in this cluster similar drugs clustering together. Maybe we can assign vanillin mode of, mode of action based on this neighboring on the neighboring drugs on this cluster. Um, and again, what we found out here was that vanillin is sitting just next to acetylsalicylic acid. And to make my life easy, from now on, I will call acetylsalicylic acid aspirin because it is what it is. Um, so <laughs> what, we, what, we, uh, uh, what we know about aspirin, so about vanillin, we didn't know much. But it is pretty known about aspirin or salicylate that is, uh, that is uh, a very structurally very, very similar compound is that it can promote drug resistance by activating the expression of efflux pumps in bacteria. So efflux pumps are pumps that lie in the envelope of the bacteria um, that can export a, a, a wide range of, of, of compounds, including antibiotics. And what it is known about uh, vanillin is that, sorry, about uh, what was known about uh, aspirin is that it can basically activate uh, the, 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 the transcription of transcription of the of the genes coding for the pumps via uh, the repression of an activator that is called MARA. And in order to show this that vanillin works the same way, 
we this is this is protein level so we measure protein levels of acra of the pump component and what you can show what you can see here is that the protein levels of of the pumps is increased either when we add vanillin or when we add aspirin and this is happening in a mara dependent manner because once we delete mara um, this increase is not there anymore. So basically, this allows to conclude that vanillin is anti or can antagonize efflux dependent antibiotics by increasing efflux via MARAD repression. And with that, I will move on to, to tell you um, how, how we um, showed clinical relevance uh, of, of our studies, at least a little bit. But maybe before I move, I can ask you do you have questions? Because so far is there is there any questions anybody uh okay i i do have a question just okay. maybe for the sake of uh, was this hypothesis that uh, certain drugs that have to do nothing with antibacterials could affect how bacterials take on antibiotics was it something that was proposed or known or even like thought when when giving out uh, therapies uh well there I'm, I'm not sure i understand your question if i mean it is known for example it is known that none non antibiotics can interfere with the activity of with active activity of, of, of antibiotics and this is one of the reasons why for example salicylate will also or aspirin we were expecting this to give a lot of antagonisms okay so, if that's the question, yeah. yeah. We did not know that vanillin would do the same. Okay. Yeah. So also when we selected these drugs in the beginning, we also on purpose included compounds uh, that we know we would behave like this and that they are known to behave like this. So that we could have some reference that we can then- Yeah, as, co as controls, right? That you know it will happen, yeah. Okay. So then um, I will just show you a little bit on how we how we uh, show clinical relevance. So, I mean, we are not uh, we are not a, a, a mouse uh, a lab or or uh, or experts on on in pharmacokinetics. Uh, but one thing we can do. So we team up with a collaborator that was at the hospital, um, and we gathered the 20, 20 potent synergies that we detected in our study, um, and we tested them against in vitro. We are talking about in vitro here. Uh, and we tested them against six uh, strains, six, 16 multidrug resistant strains, three E. coli's and three uh, Klebsiella's. And from these 20, we found eight that were very successful, that we could observe synergies against multidrug resistant strains. And this was quite remarkable because as I told you in the beginning, we decided to go uh, for uh, antibiotic sensitive strains because we are interested in the whole uh, biology uh, and we don't want to be driven by antibiotic resistance markers, but it's quite rewarding to find out that even what, you found, what we found with our, with our um, so, so to say, lab strains um, can also be used to learn uh, how to handle resistance strains. And I showed two examples. So we made sure that we included all kinds of sorts of nasty, nasty resistance, extended spectrobeta lactamases, carbapenem resistance, colistin resistance, whatever we could find. Um, and this is how one can uh, observe uh, a drug drug interaction. So here we have studies from mycin, this is a macrolide, it targets protein biosynthesis against colistin. Colistin is um, it's, it's, uh, um, antimicrobial peptide that uh, targets the lipopolysaccharide, so it targets the outer membrane of gram negative bacterium. Um, it is not a very popular antibiotic because it's quite toxic for the for the host, and therefore uh, um, it's only used in really, 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 really extreme cases. But even against colistin, the bacteria already there are already bacteria in the clinics around that uh, that uh, are resistant against this drug. And basically, what you can what I can tell you to I don't want to put a lot of time in explaining how to interpret these plots. What you can take for a fact, believe me here, I can explain if you have doubts, is that if the, the if the white um, if the white squares they look like this if it has like this kind of, of shape like an L shape this is a strong synergy yeah and just for you to appreciate we found that the synergy between uh, macrolides and colistin was uh, spanning all the clinical isolates that we tried 
including this, this last one here. And this last one is particularly important because it's colistin resistance. So we found out that this, this synergy could be, can be used to overcome colistin resistance. And more or less at the same time as we, as we, were, as we were publishing this story, there was a story coming out uh, from uh, uh, two big groups in, in Toronto, Canada. This is uh, Jerry Ryan and Eric Brown, where they actually found out exactly the same thing and they, and they showed it works beautifully in mice. Another synergy that I was that I would like to share with you. Uh, it's we found out vanillin. So vanillin that I just show you that can can promote a lot of a lot of antagonisms. We found out that it actually promotes the activity of spectinomycin against E. coli, against resistant isolates of E. coli. Um, and uh, we were quite we were very interested on this because. It, it does, I mean, we eat vanillin every day. I, it's not a toxic thing unless you eat, uh, I guess, everything becomes toxic, it's too much. But uh, so in principle, um, uh, food compounds could also be used to potentiate, uh, to potentiate drugs. And I will, come back, I will come back to this interaction in a minute. And just to let you know that we did not do mouse models, but we did try uh, and validate these interactions in the larvae, in the larvae uh, in vivo uh, model. So I was again, very interested in this last one because we just thought that vanillin gives a lot of antagonism. So how come now we see it uh, giving a synergy? And this is as much as we knew. The only thing we knew about this about this combination when we when we got when we found it was that okay, it is specific for E. coli and Salmonella. We did not see it in Klebsiella, and we also did not see it in Pseudomonas. And by that time, when we picked this up, we also didn't know that vanillin was inducing uh, 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 flux. We didn't know much. So basically what we decided to do was that we, take the, we took the combination and we probe it against a, a, a genome-wide knockout collection uh, of E. coli. So this is called the Kyo collection. I think many people nowadays is familiar with this, with this collection. So basically we, we, did, we did this experiment in uh, agar uh, plates in each um, colony. So we pinned the entire collection in, in agar, so each colony uh, lacks one gene uh, of E. coli, and basically what we observe in a very, in a very general uh, way is that when we put the combination in a plate, what you see is exactly what you see for the wild type. They get sick, yeah. And this is what you see uh, here by this, uh, by uh, depicting this in this uh, uh, box plot. So basically, they get all sick, and this is reflected by negative interaction. Uh, score, but there are exceptions to this. So there are genes that if they are not there, this synergy doesn't happen anymore. So we hypothesize that these genes have, some, have something to do with the mechanism of action of this, um, of this synergy. And then we went through the list of, the, of, this, of these genes. There is not many. Um, and one of the top of the list was a multi-drug facilitator. It's called multi-drug multi facilitator A, MDFA. And, and when I saw it, I was really, really happy because um, I checked, and this gene exists in E. coli, exists in Salmonella, but it does not exist in Klebsiella and Pseudomonas where this synergy does not occur. So they give, this give, gave me already some confidence as that well, maybe, I mean, it explains species specificity, maybe it, it works. On the other hand, it was quite intriguing because this is a multi-drug facilitator A, is an efflux pump. And usually, uh, when you delete efflux pumps, you get very sensitive to drugs, but you don't get resistant. So what we did, what usually, what we asked at this point is, can an efflux pump be actually promoting drug uptake? Yeah. So what we did was uh, that we measured intracellular uh, uh, concentration of spectinomycin in this case of E. coli alone and in the presence of, of uh, vanillin. And here we observed a fourfold increase. So vanillin at this concentration doesn't really make them sick, but sure enough, they accumulate a lot of spectinomycin inside. And when we deleted MDFA, uh, this effect was gone. And also uh, the accumulation of spectinomycin itself is anyway a little bit, a little bit less. So one thing we were sure, vanillin seems to promote the uptake of spectinomycin via MDFA. We don't know exactly how, but it was sufficient for it, for, for closing the story. Um, and with that, uh, I this brings me to the end of uh, this part of the talk, uh, where I hope I showed you that, yeah, drug combinations are conserved within species, but are species specific. Um, and 
another thing I will just chose, choose uh, the things that I wanted to and I want to mention here. And another thing that we uh, observe is that there is a very prominent decreased intracellular concentration uh, when we have antagonisms. But for for these two things, so for the species specificity or in both for the for the, uh, for the decrease intracellular concentration, we don't know broad mechanisms. We, we don't know what would be the one case or the many cases that can explain this. Um, and this is actually two questions that my group is right now working on. I hope maybe next year we have um, we have something to say here. Um, there's another story that I would like to share with you. It's a very collaborative story. I mean, the first one was already very collaborative. This one I, I like especially because it comes out of the JP, JPIMR uh, project. Um, as a center, uh, as a, as a uh, AMR center, I guess maybe you heard about this initiative before. So JPIMR funds joint um, projects on on fighting antimicrobial resistance. So it's a quite nice uh, project. And when I was still in NASA's lab, we were part. We had a, a, a JPIMR project where uh, uh, I. But Jan Willem was <laughs> part of the part of the project, and also uh, Brigitte Norm uh, and his Normax from Karolinska Institute. Um, and this is actually a project that was headed by Arnau from from um, from Jan Willem lab, and uh, they work in Streptococcus pneumoniae. So the Streptococcus pneumoniae is a, is is a commensal uh, uh, organism that lives in the nose, um, and just like it's, it's usually fine, yeah, and, but just like Staph or or Pseudomonas sometimes, sometimes when they're not fine, then they become pathogen, so-called opportunistic pathogens. An interesting thing, or an interesting thing about uh, streptococci is that streptococci is naturally competent, and this means that it has a natural ability to uptake DNA, transform DNA, and use it for its own uh, benefit. Um, and this has direct consequences in, term of, in terms of antibiotic resistance because it can quickly acquire and it can quickly acquire and probably also spread antibiotic resistance. Um, and Ian Willem's group has shown before that antibiotic treatment itself can induce uh, this competence machinery. So the question that we wanted to ask here is that can we inhibit competence? Can it be inhibited? Uh, and here I show you, I don't want to go many, many details into this, I just want to show you, this is the machinery uh, for, uh, or the regulation of, of transformation machinery, so competence. Um, and basically the point that I want to show you here is that there is a, a they call it a com uh, competence stimulating peptide that gets exported and imported. And when it gets imported, it transcriptionally activates the machinery that is required to develop competence. So basically, what we did together was that we put a transcriptional reporter in the in the in the genes that are transcriptionally uh, regulated, and we just asked, can we find compound? Can we find compounds that prevent competence development? So we screened more than one thousand three hundred compounds, um, and basically, this is what uh, the results that uh, that we obtained look like. So this would be the growth. We measured the optical density of the streptococci, so um, they grow as they grow. Um, and then normally, this would be the normal competence development profile that we will, that we were, were observing, and we measure this based on a on a luminescence recorder. And what we were looking for were situations like this, where we they grow normally, so we are not looking for compounds that, that kill or that don't, don't allow uh, pneumococci to grow because otherwise we are again putting up the selection pressure and this is definitely what we don't, don't want, but at the same time, don't allow uh, the competence development to occur. And for this, we call it comb blocker because it blocks competence development. Um, and we found more than 30 molecules with, this, with these characteristics. Many of them, were known to interact with the membrane. So I now went on and found out uh, that for this, for uh, many of these compounds, the way they prevent the development of, or they block the development of competence is that they, they interfere with the PMF. And when the PMF is not, um, uh, it's not there, then the export of this uh, um, competence stimulating peptide is, not, is no longer possible. So there is no import to promote the, the development of the competence. And, Brigitte, together with Brigitte, they, they established a, model, a mouse model for horizontal gene transfer where they showed 
that treated mice with proguanil. Proguanil is one of the, was one of these com blockers that we found. It's uh, usually it, uh, uh, or is regularly used to treat malaria, prophylaxis even. So many of us, if you already went to a malaria endemic region, uh, probably took it. This is malaron. Um, and they shown that when the mice are treated with the, with the proguanil, that uh, there is no develop, there is no uh, horizontal gene transfer occurring in, in streptococci. And with that, I just want to quickly show you. So as I said, uh, my lab is relatively recent. Uh, my students are now one and a half year uh, uh, through. It has been a little bit hard to establish technology because of the, because of the pandemics, but we are moving. Um, I have mostly two big projects uh, in the lab or two big topics in the lab. Um, one part focuses on understanding species specificity and molecular mechanisms of cell death by combinations while the other part uh, is under trying to understand the impact of host chemicals on bacterial sensory reaction uh, networks. And this is actually a consortia with some other, with another professor here from, from, from Wordsworth. And with um, that, I thank you very much for your attention. I thank my collaborators for helping us in our project, my mentors, because it's very important uh, to have people that you can uh, always um, refer to and ask when you're in doubt. Uh, and of course, funding, um, uh, for uh, allowing me to make uh, the lab uh, a very nice place to be with very happy people, uh, I hope. <laughs> and this is my team as of uh, last uh, spring. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Uh, it was great to hear. Um, we can now open, um, we got some, some uh, applauses from the audience <laughs> in form of emoticon. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can open now questions. If you guys have questions, you can just open up your mic and pose your questions directly or write them on the chat if you prefer. Uh, meanwhile, I think one question that I have for you, maybe you can, for the people that are listening to us that don't have so much of a, a technical background, if you can explain a bit more in detail, how do you get to do such a huge screenings of things and get half a million growth curves in in a in a feasible time time span yeah it's really uh, so you're really depending on on automatic uh, i can maybe i will just go back wait a minute i will just go back to the right slide so we, we basically rely on machines so we have uh, we have um so these machines are now, we, are also, we also got them in the lab, they're installed a few months ago. Uh, so basically what we used, we used the uh, uh, pipetting machine in order to make sure that we can, in, so if, if you see this for this screen, I think I had more than 1000 plates, yeah? That we don't measure only the end point, we measure over time, yeah? Um, and for, uh, for this 1000 plates, you need to have 380 cores, which is very difficult to pipet by hand already, yeah? So just to pipe at the plates, you, you, you need to have, and, and, and it's precision pipetting, so to say. It's not uh, super low volume, but you need to pipe it quite carefully. For those of you that work with, the, with sub MIC concentrations of, of antibiotics, this is uh, very tricky. So you need to be quite careful on the pipetting. So we use definitely machines, pipetting machines, pipetting robots to get all the drugs and the bugs in the plates. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have actually such machines um, coupled to to uh, 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 shaker and incubators, uh, shakers and plate readers, where the plates can go back and forth and be being monitored, be monitored over time. So it's every, uh, almost everything super auto automat automatized. <laughs> yes, it doesn't mean uh, this is a yes. Let's say that's the, that's the short answer. But usually, when you have machines that do your work, you just want to do more work. <laughs> no, no, of course, of course. Well, but yeah. you can work for something else, of course. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. Uh, very cool, very interesting. Uh, anybody has any questions before I ask another question? <laughs> okay. Um, here we have a comment by Alisa, one of our PhD students. Very interesting talk, especially the finding that food additives might promote uptake of antibiotics. In the future, do you think we will see prescriptions from medicals recommending antibiotics together with food additives for treatment of infections? Um, I don't. I don't know. So one thing that is that needs to be uh, clarified is that this would need to be tested because um, and formulated properly. Yeah, I 
I mean, what I can tell you is that there are, so when, when a drug is developed, there are uh, foods, so to say, that are contraindicated. So for example, if you take, uh, and, and might be the reason is at all not, not, not because of the bacteria, yeah? So what we see in the tube, it's quite different than what we see in the body. I believe that in the body, the synergy could also occur, but we need to make sure that this drug and this additive, in this case, vanilla, would need to get to the bug at the same time at the right concentration, yeah? So I don't know, probably the best way to formulate this is that it would be probably to give, um, uh, to give a, a, a pill where both things are there or to promote to study what's the best pharmacokinetic strategy for the additive to get it there. And I don't know if eating is the best. I don't know. It really depends. You need to say, don't eat, then eat. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have some questions coming in the chat. Uh, Nara Jan is asking, he has two questions. Uh, what would the role of host factors for antagonisms or synergy? What would be the role of host factors for antagonism or synergy? Massive. So it depends really or, or on, on when we are, what, what's the lifestyle of the bacteria inside. So for example, we have a project where we have salmonella. Salmonella is an intracellular pathogen. Um, and we, we already know that some, some uh, synergies or antagonisms that uh, work in a, in a tube uh, work differently when they are. And, and it goes both directions. There are some, there are, there are synergy dependent uh, um, uh, macrophage dependent, so to say, so they are depending on the host, but there are also some that we probably will lose. We didn't do this extensively yet, but it's on planning. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there was a, they said two questions, so there's one coming up, I guess, at some point. Um, okay, here we have another one by Anna Olson. Um, could you elaborate on the definition of synergy? For example, how is synergy or antagonism defined when measuring OD? Yeah. Uh, so synergy and defining synergy and antagonism is um, not trivial and there are models established for that. So we did not establish a new model. We took an established model. The two most common models used would be love additivity or bliss interaction. In our, uh, or bliss independence, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and in our case, we use bliss independency. So this is a model uh, that assumes that the two drugs act independently and you basically um, just have to measure the effect of the drugs and uh, multiply, multiply the effect of these drugs. And if you have a deviation from this multiplication to the positive side is an antagonism to the negative side is a synergy. Yeah, so this is how we, we define one, of, one beautiful uh, thing about this model. It's, it's very simple, um, but you can use it uh, against, uh, you can use it when you have resistance strains with which, which with um, love is not possible. And this was very important for us because pseudomonas is resistant to a lot of things. Hey, thank you. We have more questions. <laughs> nice, we have some time. Um, do you monitor the pH in the well? Do you think it might play a role for synergy? Um, I don't know. This is a good question. So th these questions come up sometimes or once in a while they always come up. What happens if I change the medium? What happens if, uh, if uh, pH in a way it's, it goes along this? So we did all the experiments in LB for the simple reason that LB can be used for the three organisms without a, the three microbes without a, a problem. And usually what happens is that LB is not buffered. So there is a tendency for acidification during, throughout, throughout the, the, the growth. Um, but I don't know what would happen if we, if we basically buffer it. Mm -hmm. We did not measure because, or monitor it because we have very little amount of it. <laughs> uh, we were running this in 384 well plates with 40 microliters of LB inside. So we did not monitor it, but I, I, I don't know if, if uh, pH might, might play a role. Um, 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 I just, just to be right. also to be more thorough here, there are some drugs that are actually known to be pH dependent. So it might be that also influences some in some cases more than others. Um, I guess related with that, uh, there uh, someone is asking: Do you think Muller Hinton would have been a better choice because we usually use them for susceptibility tests? Never tried it, but uh, when we measure the the LB the the MICs on LB. It's very similar to what you obtain in Muller Hinton. Mm -hmm. So I never tried, but I suspect, I think differences, strong differences will come if you go from a complete medium 
to a, a minimum medium where you have a completely different metabolic, uh, you need a completely, completely different, different metabolic set of enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, but from complete to complete medium, I don't know if this will change a lot. And another question, uh, just curious, during drug synergy, did you happen to see enhanced drug concentration inside the cell for colistin resistant mm -hmm. to multi-drug resistant, resistant Klebsiella? We didn't measure. Hmm. We did not measure. Um, but I should know the answer because maybe, uh, I don't know. I don't know if this other study measured that. This is what would be believed that colistin would promote the uptake of the bacteroid, but we didn't measure. That's the easy answer here. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. um, anybody, yeah. any other questions? I know for a fact that uh, I think, yeah, okay, here. Fernando Docobos says, both LB and muller hinton broth use amino acids as carbon source. For some drugs, no differences should be observed. So yeah, that's the same thing. Um, Narayan had another question, but I think they left. So um, uh, I did have a question about the last part about um, inhibiting competence. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this is kind of far, far out of what you guys are studying, but uh, what do you think would be the use of such a drug? Let's say that we make a drug that inhibits uh, competence, right? Mm -hmm. How would such a drug be used? In what conditions or with what, to which end? I think the ideal thing, so the thing is that uh, uh, streptococca is a, it's, it's a commensal, so it's there anyway. So let's say that you are treating an infection by um, Staph aureus in your food, yeah? But you take it, you take the antibiotic uh, generically, systemically, so you take the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that if, if, uh, if uh, anti and this antibiotic is selecting the whole, the whole, is putting a selection pressure in the whole microbiome, on the whole microbiota, including the guys that live in your nose, um, and it's even sometimes promoting the development of this competence. So the idea could be, for example, that as soon as you have to take an antibiotic, you could maybe um, take a, a, a competence uh, a, a compound that would decrease the development of compass or block the development of, com of competence to relieve a little bit the facility that they have to, to, to acquire this, this resistance. This would be, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in principle, I see it would be good to prevent this, uh, this horizontal gene transfer at all times, but it's not like we should be taking that all the time because that kind of yeah. is the purpose, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have here another question. It, this is probably a far-fetched question, but how do you see these findings help in effective drug prescriptions? Uh, I see a long way. <laughs> uh, so I think this is... Um, it, it very often it very often come, comes up uh, uh, comes up this question and my take on this is always very fair you know um, I, I think it's it because nowadays antibi antibiotic development is so challenging or drug development in general is so challenging that um, I, I rather believe that uh, we should all work together and everybody does what they are good doing because then the whole thing works best so that's my that's my my personal opinion on this so meaning that if we really want to bring these things for clinics, we, we need to collaborate with the animal experimentalists, with pharmacokinetic uh, uh, developing people. And in principle, there should be also pharma companies interested in, in this kind of research, which is something that we could discuss in the podcast, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a long way. Yeah. Um, I mean, in, in this uh, line, I just want to mention that our next uh, workshop at UAC is about uh, antibiotic combinations, and we're going to have three uh, speakers, so that is going to come up to the website very soon, so open for registration. Anybody that is interested in this particular talk today, I'm sure they're going to enjoy a lot the workshop mm -hmm. on the 27th of May, so that's coming up. Have an eye for that, and Fernando also writes now, what about the role of oxygen concentration? We have observed that using a small wells with a proper aeration, some anaerobiosis appears. Have you seen any biases depending on the method used? Many thanks. Um, I mean, definitely. So we this is something that we debated quite quite a bit before. Um, so definitely, it needs to be acknowledged uh, that uh, the, the, the cultivation way or the cultivation method for the bacterium will determine the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is uh, not uh, not, uh, and even the MIC of certain drugs will be um, uh, will be oxygen dependent. 
What I can tell you is that we managed to grow pseudomonas on these plates and they grew, they, they grew okay. Um, uh, and they, they need oxygen, yeah. So it's, they are aerobes. And we saw that we have good activity of amino glucoside antibiotics that are strictly depending on a good aeration. So in that sense, I don't think that is a killer, but if you ask me, does it change when we, when we go to 96 12 plates? Yes, it changes. My change. Cannot put my hand on fire. Mm, uh, we have another question. I happen to see you use antifungals for, for your screening. What was the outcome? Any, uh, what antifungal exactly was used? Yeah, uh, for that I am. I don't. I don't want to claim because we used only one, and it was a uh, flu cytosine. I think it was uh, something that was found to interfere with pseudomonas at some point. Um, but we did not screen enough antifungals to have anything, uh, any answer, a useful answer for you. So I would say right now we don't know. The reason why we didn't include many antifungals is because they are toxic. They are quite toxic anyway for the host. So I don't think that anybody would like to administer an antibiotic together with an antifungal unless, unless it's really, really, really a bacteria that is super multi-resistant and is killing you. Because the people, the, 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 the doctors will not be happy to, antifungals are also very precious. No? Like they, they will not be happy to. So this yeah. um, all right, any other questions? Yeah, I mean, those are four cases, the same as colistin. When you use colistin, it's just because there is nothing else that you can. Yes. And, and with antifungals, I guess you also don't want to use them to increase the pressure of potential resistance in the in the fungi. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, the situation for bacteria is very bad, but it's not that for fungus is better. So, no, um, exactly. We, sometimes we forget that AMR is more than bacteria, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, fungus yeah. are also really nasty. So. Indeed. Let's, let's leave the antifungals for them. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, anybody has any more questions? We had a lot of very nice, and thank you so much for the interactivity and posting your questions, it was great. Thanks a lot for the invitation, it was very nice. Yeah, thank you so much Anna, for being with us. And with this, I think we're gonna close out the seminar a little bit before time, so that's nice. You guys can have a coffee before going to the next thing. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember the next episode of the podcast, we have Anna featuring an interview and we will have a workshop on antibiotic combinations on the 27th of May. And that's coming up on the website in one hour, I hope. <laughs> um, again, thank you, Anna, for being with us. And I hope we get uh, still in contact and we talk right. about what's coming up in the future, which seems very interesting. All right. Have fun. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Ciao.